All right, well, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for the information session regarding the fall 2021 guidance from the Student and Exchange Visitor Program. Uh, my name is Christina Kahn and I'm the director of UCF Global and I'll be co-hosting today's info session uh, with Zach. Zach, wanna go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Yes, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Zach Saloum. I'm the assistant director here at UCF Global and um, I'll be co-hosting it with Christina as well. We're excited to share this valuable information with you. Thank you, Zach. Well, today, this session is being recorded. It's also being live streamed on YouTube. And after today's session, the recording will be posted to UCF Global's YouTube channel. So if you have questions, you wanna refer back to it, it will be available a little bit later on on YouTube. Uh, we ask that you please use the chat feature uh, in the Zoom uh, to type any questions that you have. Um, you know, we probably won't be able to get to like extremely specific ones that are related to your particular situation, but more general questions about the guidance or the things that we're talking about, we will be happy to address. Uh, we, we do have, um, we do thank everyone for submitting, pre-submitting questions. Uh, we have incorporated those questions into the presentation, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to get an answer to all of your questions today. We also are joined with the other uh, in immigration advisors. We have uh, Chelsea and Sherry, as well as our admission specialist, Elise, Rodney, Tariana, and Shahira are on the call, on the Zoom as well, and we'll be also monitoring the chat, responding to questions, and helping with today's session. So our agenda for today, we are going to provide an overview of the Student and Exchange Visitor Program, or SEVP guidance for fall 2021. We'll talk about your enrollment requirements, what it all means, as well as some travel considerations. Um, based on the questions that we received, I know that many have questions about uh, traveling back to the United States, so we'll be sure to answer travel-related questions. And then we have a question, time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, so please note, as has been the case throughout the pandemic, the COVID-19 situation is still fluid. Uh, so the information we're presenting today is accurate and current today, but that doesn't mean that it can't change in the future, especially related to um, travel-related guidance uh, with when we're talking about the CDC guidance. Those things are still very fluid, uh, but today the information is accurate as of today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to give a reminder. Uh, you should have received an email from UCF Global about the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund or HERF funds. These are grants up to $1,000 for COVID-19 assistance. International students are eligible. We strongly encourage you to submit your application. Uh, applications close July 30th, and we encourage you to apply early. So be sure to submit your application. Uh, we know that any little bit, bit helps, especially uh, COVID has impacted so many. And so we wanna make sure that you're aware of this opportunity and uh, that you apply uh, if, you, if you feel you're eligible. Um, check your Knights email for more information. You've got emails from UCF Global about it, but if you have any questions, Questions, you're always welcome to contact us. So as we get started, we're going to have a couple key terms that will reappear throughout today's presentation. So we just wanted to go over those briefly so that we're all uh, working from the same um, vocabulary. So uh, first we'll talk a lot about SEVP. This is the Student and Exchange Visitor Program. It's a government agency that's part of Immigration and Customs Enforcement within the US Department of Homeland Security. So SEVP is responsible for CVIS, is as well as F visa students. And then that brings us to our next key term, which is CVIS. This is the Student and Exchange Visitor Information System. It's a government database that's used to report information about your program. Um, and it's also, it's used by UCF Global's designated school officials to, or DSOs to issue your I-20 or your DS-2019 if you have a J visa. Your I-20 or your DS-2019 is the official document issued in CVIS. I-20s indicate your eligibility for an F-1 visa and DS-2019s are the forms that indicate your eligibility for a J-1 visa. So those are some key terms you'll hear a lot through today's presentation. So I wanted to make sure we were uh, starting from the same place on those. So let's jump right into the guidance for fall 2021. 
So uh, SEVP clarified their guidance very recently. And because of this clarification, there are not going to be any changes to the current guidance that's been in place throughout the pandemic. So for most of the students on today's Zoom meeting um, on the, at the info session, most of you have been enrolled at UCF for at least a few semesters. So there really aren't gonna be any changes from what we had in place in the summer and, and in the, the past spring. So this means that students who are continuing in their program, who have an active CVIS record can continue to take all online classes. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, students who have an initial I-20 uh, that has a fall 2021 start date. So this might be new students or students who are returning from time outside of the United States who have a brand new I-20 that's been issued. You have to have a, at least a one credit in person. So let's talk a little bit about more about what are in-person versus online classes. So at UCF, there are many different course modalities, meaning the, the manner in which the courses are taught. And so you're able to see the modality of your course when you're registering for the course or viewing your schedule in your My UCF. You actually need to click on the, the actual course to view the course details. And you'll see this in two places. You'll see it in the instruction mode, as well as in the class details. You need to look in both places uh, to determine if your course is an in-person or an online course. So at UCF, in-person courses for immigration purposes are the following. Uh, they are face-to-face -face or blend flex courses, P sections, mixed mode, reduced seat time courses, which are M section, video streaming, uh, reduced seat time. It's, you have to be careful with this one. It's that really you're looking for reduced seat time. Our S sections are in person and then active learning, reduced seat time. Our A sections are in person. Online classes are video streaming, which are V and V1 sections and then World Wide Web W section courses. So you have to really pay attention when you're registering for your classes or viewing your course schedule that you, if you have an in-person requirement, meaning you have an initial I-20 with the fall 2021 start date, that you have at least an in -per one in-person course. Okay, so let's break down what are the enrollment requirements for fall 2021. So if you are a continuing student, meaning Fall 2021 is not your first semester. It's not your program start date on your I-20. You've been enrolled, you're continuing in your program. Uh, you are not required to have an in-person course. So for bachelor students, this means you need to take at least 12 credit hours. Uh, you do not have to be enrolled online, but I do wanna give a really big caveat that UCF is resuming in-person activities uh, to a greater extent in the fall semester. So it may not be possible to have all of your classes online. There simply may not be online sections of the classes you need. There may, there may not. It will depend on your program and the courses being offered in your program. So you'll, so it may, while immigration guidance will allow you to have fully online classes, it may not be possible if the classes you need are only offered in person. So you'll, you can verify this by going into your My UCF to register for classes or also checking your current enrollment if you've already enrolled in your classes for fall. So graduate students need nine credit hours. Uh, students, master students who have finished all coursework and only have their thesis, you need three credits of thesis. Uh, doctoral students who have passed candidacy and are only enrolled in dissertation, you only need three credits of dissertation to be considered full time. Students in the intensive English program and the Global Achievement Academy prep program need to be enrolled in five intensive English program courses. All of the intensive English course, courses are being offered in person. So while you could take online classes, your classes are actually being offered in person in the UCF Global Building. The students in the Global Achievement Academy two and three programs need to have 14 credit hours. And students in the Global Achievement Academy University Integration UI program need to have at least 12 credit hours. Now for students who have been issued an initial I-20 for fall 2021, and this means your I-20 has a program start date of fall 2021, it's an initial I-20, 
uh, you need to have an in-person requirement. The minimum is at least one credit hour that is in-person. Um, so for bachelor students, you still need 12 credit hours. Of, of those 12 credit hours, at least one credit must be in-person. Graduate students, you need nine credit hours, of which at least one credit must be in-person. Uh, our intensive English program and, and prep students need to have uh, five IEP classes and at least one class needs to be in person, but we know that your classes are all gonna be in person anyway. And then our, our uh, GAA students need 14 credit hours with one credit being in person. And our UI students need 12 credit hours with one being in person. Again, the in-person requirement is for those that have an initial I-20 with a fall 2021 start date. If you are unsure which category you fall into, please contact us. Um, if uh, one of our advisors could put the INTL advising email address in the chat, we'll, we'll drop the email address in the chat, but please contact us if you're unsure. Uh, we would be happy to look up your record and let you know which, which category you need to follow. All right, so what if you're currently outside of the United States? What do you need to know? So if you are currently outside of the US and you, you have an active SEVIS record, you can continue to take full-time classes from your home country if, you, if the classes you need are offered online. So it's important to remember because UCF is returning to in-person operations for fall, it may be necessary to return to campus if the classes that you need are offered in person. So if you register for an in-person course, you're expected to be on campus following the attendance policy that the course instructor has listed in your syllabus. So it's very important that you do pay attention to the modality of the course if you are going to be enrolling from your home country or from outside of the United States. As long as you are enrolled full-time, you can keep an active SEVIS record, which is, which is great. Uh, if you're not able to return to the United States, we understand that for some students, maybe your visa has expired and the US embassy in your country may not have resumed normal visa services yet. That's pretty common still. Um, or you know, personal circumstances, you'd prefer to just be online. That's fine. Uh, you can continue to be enrolled full-time online from home as long as the classes you need are, are online. Um, if you're not able to enroll full-time, meaning either the classes you need are only in person or you can't get your full-time requirements met, or if you just want to take the semester off, uh, you need to submit the exit form to UCF Global by the first day of classes, which is August 23rd. You can email it to uh, the INTL advising at ucf.edu email that we put in the chat. So when you submit an exit form, meaning you're not going to be enrolling full time or you're taking the semester off, this means that your CVIS record will be terminated for authorized early withdrawal. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. Uh, you're not, in, in that case, you're not required to enroll in any classes, though you could choose to do so if you would like. A special note for our thesis and dissertation students, you may need to request a special leave of absence from the College of Graduate Studies um, as kind of a separate academic approval, separate from the immigration authorization for this. And you would most likely need to have a brand new initial I-20 to return to the US to resume your studies in a future semester. So what does it mean to have SEVIS record termination for authorized early withdrawal or AEW? Uh, it's basically, it means that your SEVIS record is terminated or closed. And it sounds a lot scarier than it is. It basically means a leave of absence. Uh, it does mean that you would need a new I-20 to return to the US to resume your in-person studies. But having a SEVIS record terminated for authorized early withdrawal does not impact your ability to take classes online or to earn academic credit or achieve your degrees. Your immigration status is separate from your ability to make progress in your, in your degree academically at UCF. What does receiving a new initial I-20 mean? What are the implications of that? Well, um, if, you, if you do submit the exit form, meaning you're not going to be enrolled full time or you're taking the semester off in fall and your CVIS is terminated for authorized early withdrawal, you can request a new initial I-20 to return in spring 2022 or even a later semester. 
um, it, we have a request online. It's, we will help you get through that process, but it will require that you pay the CVIS I-901 government fee again. That fee is $350. You'll pay it on the new CVIS number once the new I-20 is issued to you. It also resets your eligibility for curricular practical training, CPT, and optional practical training, OPT. So this means you'd need to be enrolled for a full academic year, which is a fall and a spring semester, before you'd be eligible for CPT or OPT. So coming back and being enrolled on that new CVIS record for a full academic year before you're eligible again to apply for CPT or OPT. So for students very early in their program, this probably isn't a big deal, but if you're getting close to graduation, this is probably something you'll want to factor into your decision making process. Uh, for in terms of visa, you would only need to apply for a new F1 or J1 visa if your um, F1 visa expires before you plan to return to the United States. So I'm going to hand it over to Zach to talk about some travel considerations. Thank you, Christina. Hi again, everyone. Zach Saloum here, Assistant Director at UCF Global. And we recognize that some of you may have returned home because of the pandemic or you know, because of the summer semester. And so we wanna spend some time over the next few minutes to talk about travel considerations um, due to the pandemic, but also due to this new guidance how travel um, might impact you, uh, may, might impact your ability to maintain your status. And I think I'll preface everything by saying, we understand that travel, there's inherent risk associated with all travel, more so now with the pandemic and all of the travel restrictions that are in place, which we will discuss. And so we are here for you. We're here to walk through this challenging time with you. And this is part of the reason why we wanna cover this information. So I think we can start off by basically um, addressing the, the required documents that are needed for a successful return into the United States. So as you might be preparing for your return into the United States, maybe to return for fall 2021, what do you need to have in your possession for a successful return? And that's a valid passport. We always recommend our students to have a valid passport for at least six months beyond the, the, the semester start date, which would be August 23rd. So six months beyond August 23rd would be ideal, but a valid passport, a valid visa, and the visa just has to be valid for the date that you're intended to arrive. It doesn't necessarily have to be valid for six months beyond the program start date, but certainly a valid visa is required. A valid form I-20 or form DS-2019. And the, the important caveat is if you are a returning student, uh, that form I-20 or form DS-2019 must have a travel signature applied to it on page two. And that travel signature needs to have been issued within the last 12 months. And we'll talk a little bit more about travel signatures in a few slides. We also recommend that students bring a copy of their transcript, proof of enrollment. If you have an assistantship or a fellowship, maybe bring an employment verification or an assistantship verification letter. Uh, even though this is not required of you, um, students have found it to be helpful at the port of entry uh, if, if they're asked additional questions to, to provide some proof. And then one of the most critical items that is new as of late is a negative COVID test. A negative COVID test must be in your possession, printed out, and must have been issued to you within the, within the prior three days from travel. So you can't show a negative COVID test from three months ago. You have to show a negative COVID test that was administered to you three days or less prior to your travel date. They're likely going to look for that before you even board the plane uh, in your home countries. So we certainly want to make sure that you have that. All right, so we did mention about a travel signature being required for a successful return into the United States. Well, how do you get a travel signature? Uh, because we're operating, um, you know, out, outside, you're outside of the United States and we're inside of the United States. And in order to be efficient with time and because SEVP allows us now to send electronic I-20s, you can simply email your request for a travel signature. 
That's the email uh, that you should be notifying. It's our main inbox that all of the immigration advisors check regularly. And you will include the following information in your travel signature request. You'll include your full name, your UCF ID, your PID, uh, the date of your last travel signature, if you have one, so that we can check to make sure you even need a travel signature in the first place, and the date of your expected return into the United States. And if you have your travel plans already arranged or you have a boarding pass or travel itinerary, itinerary available, you're certainly welcome to send that as well, just so we can get a clear indication of when you expect to return. Um, so if you send that information to us, we will be sure to provide you with a travel signature. We will email you your new I-20, and you're welcome to print out that I-20 at home, sign it, and bring that new I-20, that printed I-20 that we've emailed to you, uh, to the port of entry. Um, now, Christina mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, and I think it's worth reiterating that this is a fluid situation. Lots, of, lots are changing, um, travel restrictions are coming and going, and so it's important for us to remain informed so that we can inform the students, but it's also incumbent upon you to take a look at these websites to make sure that you do not have some sort of travel restriction or travel imposition placed upon you based on where you're traveling from. Two main websites that we have found to be very reliable websites and that we are directing students to are the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC website at the US government. That website will provide you with information about entry requirements as it pertains to COVID-19. What restrictions are in place based on the country you're traveling from, based on your vaccination status, your testing status, things like that. The U.S. Department of State is also a good website to visit for information about um, other travel restrictions, also based on COVID, but also just general travel information on entry into the United States, uh, visa information, all, all entry, all international entry uh, information. We also advise students to visit their, their airline that they're planning to travel with, uh, your own home country's government website because all of those resources are reliable resources for you to get up-to-date information. Those sources are going to be up, updating their websites and their pages in real time as guidance comes from your government, from the US government, and from your airline. Uh, we, ad we simply advise you to go to those sources first. We have many students from the following countries, and unfortunately, there are current entry restrictions in place for students planning to arrive from those countries directly. Those countries as of today are Brazil, China, India, Iran, and South Africa. If you are presently in those countries, you are unable to arrive into the United States right now, uh, and we'll get into more details, but you're unable to arrive into the United States directly. If you want to arrive into the United States in the next few weeks, you will need to travel to a third country in order to quarantine there before entry into the United States. But if we go to the next slide, I do want to mention that there are some exemptions, and we will talk about the specific dates that those exemptions become active. So there are current national interest exemptions for any students inbound traveling from the Schengen area of Europe, the Republic of Ireland, and the United Kingdom. Which means if you are hailing from any of those areas, the Schengen area, the Republic of Ireland, or the United Kingdom, you have a current national interest exemption, meaning you can enter from those areas now you do not need to quarantine in another area, nor do you need to delay your travel inbound into the United States. If you are coming from one of the countries that we mentioned in the previous slide, Brazil, China, India, Iran, or South Africa, um, you also have a national interest exemption as an F1 or J1 student, which is great. However, that national interest exemption does not take place until uh, August 1st, or at least programs that are beginning on or after August 1st. 
And we know, you can go to the next slide, we know that, um, that you are able to enter the United States up to 30 days prior to the program start date. So for those of you entering perhaps on a new initial I-20, that would be for travel um, after July 24th. So to summarize, um, because I don't want to increase the confusion, I wanna decrease the confusion. To summarize, the students that are okay to travel now, countries inbound travel that are okay now are any students coming directly from the Schengen area of Europe, Republic of Ireland or the United Kingdom, you are free to enter the United States anytime between now and the beginning of fall if you have those valid documents that we addressed in the previous slide. Uh, if you are coming from Brazil, China, India, Iran, or South Africa, you may enter without traveling first to a third country if you enter after July 24th, which is 30 days prior to the start of fall. The way that the Customs and Border Protection Officer is going to interpret that is you are arriving for a program that begins on or after August 1st. You are arriving 30 days prior to that program start date, which is July 24th or later. If you wanna be safe, you can simply arrange for travel after August 1st, but just know that if for whatever personal reasons you wish to travel after July 24th, you'll be perfectly able to do so if you're from any of those countries. And if you're from Schengen, Ireland, or United Kingdom, you will be able to enter even before that. So again, uh, what to do once you arrive into the United States, we are following all of the CDC guidance for self-isolation, for quarantining, for testing, and we certainly have vaccination available on campus once you do return. But we refer you to the CDC guidance, as we mentioned the website before, um, and, and visit the page for returning from international travel, because again, that's going to be your most reliable source, and that's gonna be your most up-to-date source. Instructions on what to do when you arrive will vary depending on your vaccination status. And so we understand that students are coming from certain countries that have different vaccination availability and your vaccination status may vary. Um, we will be talking about it for, in our pre-arrival workshops in the coming weeks about your vaccination status and what to expect when you arrive into the United States. And I believe that there was a pre-submitted question about this, so we will be addressing more specifics a little bit later. And actually, that's a perfect segue, so we will address the pre-submitted pre questions now. Um, thank you for those of you who did submit questions. Um, I think they were applicable to, to all involved, and also just, again, a reminder that you're welcome to enter some questions that you have developed over the course of this town hall uh, in the chat. Our immigration advisors and admissions specialists are monitoring the chat in this Zoom uh, town hall. And so we will be able to address questions uh, in that manner as well. But in terms of the pre-submitted questions, the first question is, I'm back home and I cannot return for fall 2021. Maybe the visa, maybe their visa expired and they were unable to secure another one. Maybe there's a financial implication or maybe that's just simply uh, too difficult for them to travel at this time can I still take classes? The answer is yes. You can enroll full-time in online courses of study if they are available and in an online format. As long as you're enrolled full-time, you can maintain an active CVIS record. So the key phrase I believe there is enrolled full-time. We are allowing students to maintain their CVIS records from abroad, but we are still going to be monitoring your enrollment. So if you are not enrolled full time, that's not going to be, you're not gonna be eligible to maintain your status in that way. You still have to enroll full time, but you can engage in a fully online course of study. But as Christina mentioned earlier, uh, many of the classes are gonna be transitioning to in-person. So you wanna make sure that as many online courses are available as you need. Uh, what about the U UCF Global Intensive English Program? Will those classes be offered in person? The answer is yes. The UCF Global Intensive English Program classes are fully in person. We're expecting those students to return to campus to commence their program in person. Uh, for those of you in a graduate program, 
either a you know, master's degree or doctoral dissertation. Are dissertation credits and directed research credits considered in person? Yes. Uh, for those of you who are just taking simply three credits of dissertation, you've passed candidacy or you're in a master's thesis, those credits are coded as in person. So uh, you can always confirm with your academic department, but typically both of those dissertation and directed research credits are coded in person and would qualify for in-person coursework for those of you who are returning on perhaps a new initial I-20. Uh, just a reminder on how to get a travel signature. Again, you don't need a travel signature to depart the United States, but you, you will need a travel signature to return from a period abroad. Email intladvising at ucf.edu with the following information. You'll include your full name, your UCF ID, the date of your last travel signature so that we can confirm one is required of you, and the date of your expected return into the United States. If you send an email to that email, we will respond with an electronically emailed I-20 in return for you to print out at home, sign, and use for entry into the United States. Does my CVIS record affect my ability to take classes? This is an excellent question and the answer is no. If your CVIS record has been terminated for whatever reason, maybe you took a break from classes um, or you, know, you, you, you departed home and you did not enroll, if your CVIS record has been terminated, that does not affect your ability to enroll in classes. Um, you can still earn academic credit, you can still pursue your academic goals and make progress towards your degree from abroad. Your academic status is independent of your CVIS record. So that's two, we're talking about two completely different things and we don't want your CVIS record termination to deter you from continuing your academic pursuits abroad if you are able to do so. Some of our students during the COVID pandemic have actually completed their degrees from abroad, which is wonderful. So we don't want this to halt your ability to complete your degree, um, but the CVIS record itself does, does um, you, are, you are required to maintain an active CVIS record to be in the United States physically, uh, but you're not required to hold a CVIS record uh, to, to enroll in classes from abroad, for example. Uh, what are my options if I am sick? or if I have a health condition preventing me from enrolling in a full course of study. This can certainly happen and has happened to many international students in the past. If you have a documented illness or a medical condition that restricts your ability to take classes in person or it restricts your ability to take a full course of study, you can request a reduced course load. Um, this reduced course load is a simple form that you'll complete on our website and submit to an immigration advisor for review along with medical documentation. An RCL could enable you to take as little as zero credits and still maintain your CVIS record, um, but you'll wanna make sure that you submit your request prior to the beginning of the fall semester so that we can review it and authorize you to take a, a, a less than full course of study. So if that's something that applies to you, if that's something you're considering, if you've been struggling with a medical condition that's just simply preventing you from engaging in a full course of study, please consider the reduced course load option. Um, get medical documentation from your doctor that explicitly states you're advised to take uh, a certain number of credits only and send that to an immigration advisor for review before classes begin in the fall 2020, 2021. What should I do if my passport expired? Um, you need to maintain a valid passport to be in the United States. So you need to contact your country's nearest embassy, whether that be in Washington, DC, or somewhere in Florida or Texas or Atlanta, somewhere in the United States, your country likely has an embassy or consulate that services passport renewals. And we advise all of our international students to maintain a, a valid passport at all times while inside the United States. Uh, is it, this is also a good question. Is it possible to change the modality of my classes? Maybe you're looking as, you know, Christina mentioned to take a look at the modality, whether it's V or M or um, RS. So you're looking at the modality and you're realizing that this does not suit your needs. Can I change them? 
students are not able to change the modality of the course, only the academic program is. So if you find yourself in a situation where you need to change uh, courses, you can certainly change from a different section from one section to another or change out the course altogether and just take a different elective perhaps. Um, but you are not in control of the modality of the course. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you do need an in-person course and you're not enrolled in it, you need to find a different section that's offered in person or um, enroll in a completely different class altogether. I mentioned that we were going to review the, the, CDC, um, the CDC guidelines a little bit more specifically. So first we're gonna talk about testing requirements. What type of COVID test do I need to enter the United States? What does the test need to say? Different countries are administering tests differently, maybe different test uh, result sheets display different information. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the airport when you're boarding the plane, but also maybe at the port of entry in the United States, they're going to be looking for the following information. Uh, the type of test, whether it's a nucleic acid amplification test, NAAT, or an antigen test. So what type of test is it? What entity is issuing the result, whether it's a laboratory, a healthcare entity, a telehealth service, a hospital, a clinic, who is issuing the result? When the specimen was collected, remember the negative test result must show the specimen was collected within three days before the flight. So that's why they're going to be looking at the date. Uh, a positive test result for documentation of recovery from COVID-19 must show the specimen was collected within three months before the flight. Uh, information that identifies the person. So your name, your full name as it appears on your passport must be listed. Um, uh, plus at least one other identifier. So your date of birth or your passport information, passport number. And then of course the test result, whether it's positive or negative. So that you're, when you're looking at your test results, you wanna make sure that all of that information is included on the sheet. And I would also advise you to talk to your healthcare provider, the clinic, the hospital that's offering the test and letting them know that this is for the purpose of pre-flight or tr international travel because they likely will have experience on what exactly that information needs to be provided. So if you're telling them the purpose of this COVID test is so that I can uh, perform international travel, they'll be sure to include that information, but it's always good for you to check and double, double you know, make, make sure. Um, and then finally, what are my expectations for those of you arriving from abroad? What are my expectations to self quarantine upon arrival into the United States? So your guidance is going to depend on your vaccination status. And if you go to that CDC website that we referenced earlier, you will see the following information displayed. But again, right before you travel, I would make sure to just address that website again to see if anything has changed. But as of today, if you are fully vaccinated, maybe you got vaccinated um, here on campus before you travel, if you are fully vaccinated, we are still recommending that you get tested three to five days after you travel. UCF offers testing at the student health services. If your test is positive, you need to isolate yourself and protect others. Uh, but if your test is negative, then you'll simply self-monitor for COVID-19 symptoms after you travel um, and get retested if you develop those symptoms. Continue to follow all state and local guidelines as they come out. University of Central Florida is doing an excellent job of communicating those guidelines to students as they change. Uh, I also wanna focus on those students who have not had an opportunity to be vaccinated from COVID-19 because your requirements are gonna be a little bit different upon return to the United States. After international travel for students who are not vaccinated, you are also required to, are you also, um, you know, guided to get a viral test within three to five days after travel and also self-quarantine for seven days after you travel. This information might, might make you decide to travel on a, on a different date or, or tweak your international travel plans based on these CDC guidelines. So you're arriving into the United States, three to five days from your arrival or as soon as possible, you're getting tested on campus and then at the health center and then uh, subsequently, regardless of your 
the test results, you're quarantining for a full seven days. You, again, even if you test negative, you're self-isolating and quarantining for seven days. If you test positive, you will isolate yourself fully and go into the COVID-19 protocol. If you choose not to get tested for whatever reason, um, you are advised to stay home and self-quarantine for a full 10 days after international travel. Avoid being around people who are at increased risk of severe illness for 14 days, whether you get tested or not. Um, you know, you're, certainly there's, there's many students and staff walking around campus with masks, inside buildings, outside buildings. Um, you know, social distancing measures are in place still. Um, and it, again, continue to follow all state and local recommendations and requirements as they come out. So a lot of information. Um, and if you still have questions about your particular situation or you didn't feel comfortable asking it, or maybe your question was not answered as a part of this town hall, you are always welcome to contact us. Uh, that's what we're here for. So whether, whether you're outside the United States or inside the United States, you're welcome to call our main phone number, which is listed there, or you're welcome to email our main advising inbox, intladvising at ucf.edu, um, either to schedule a meeting or to get a quick question answered from an immigration advisor. Uh, we also have a dedicated website that uh, addresses coronavirus concerns, travel concerns, enrollment concerns, enrollment requirements. A lot of the information that we provided to you in this town hall is also listed on our website at global.ucf.edu forward slash coronavirus. So if you've not visited that website yet, I would recommend going there as well as another reliable source of information for enrollment requirements, travel implications, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, I think I'll kick it back to Christina to address any last minute items. Um, but thank you all for listening to this town hall. Thank you, Zach. Um, at this time, we've, we've reached the end of the presentation, but I wanted to see if there were any additional questions that our participants might have that, that haven't yet been answered or, or questions from the chat. Advisors and admission specialists, if there was anything that maybe came to you directly, can you let me know? Okay, so I see a question uh, in the chat. Uh, do we quarantine until we are tested or is it not obligatory? Um, so the CDC, I'm gonna go back to it. The CDC does advise if you're not, um, if you're not fully vaccinated, well, even if you are vaccinated, that when you return from international travel, you are getting the viral test within three to five days of returning from your travel. But if you're not vaccinated yet, they, they are advising that you do self-quarantine for the full seven days. Great question. Are there any other questions? There is another question in the chat box. Uh, so after I self quarantine for seven days, I will need to go to the student health center for the test on day eight. Uh, uh, it seems like you, within three to five days of returning from travel, that's when you're getting your test, but that you're self isolating or self quarantining for the full seven days. Then if you get the, the negative result, you're just, you're self-quarantining those seven days. If you do get the negative, if you do get the positive result that you are positive for COVID, that's, that's when you work with your health provider to figure out, you know, kind of your next steps and making sure that you get care for, for the COVID. And I'll just also quickly mention that the UCF Student Health Center has been extremely responsive to students' needs during this time. So, um, if you were returning to the United States and you have additional questions either about how to get tested, how to schedule a test, um, quarantining requirements, self-isolation requirements, I've given the UCF Student Health Center a call multiple times over the last few months to get questions like this answered for students. And they're extremely responsive by phone and by email. Um, and so I would recommend, again, if you have additional questions after arrival about getting tested, getting scheduled for a test on campus at the Student Health Center, they're doing a really good job about responding to students' needs, 
getting students tested either same day or the next day that they desire, uh, depending on when you call in, uh, and they should be giving you that rapid test result within a within you know a day or a matter of hours or so. So, um, so I think we should all be really thankful that we have that resource on campus for us, and I would you know, recommend that all students utilize that resource um, for you. Again, it's, it's, it's free of charge. And also, if you haven't yet gotten your COVID vaccine, I think as Zach mentioned earlier, you can, you can get your vaccine at the Student Health Center. Um, so that's, that's a great service as well. Were there any additional questions before we end today? All right, well, I'm not seeing anything. So if, if you do think of a question later, um, our, please feel free to contact us. We're here for you. Um, we realized that you know during these times, it's, it's stressful. There's still a lot of uncertainty and a lot of changes. We're here to help however we can. Um, thank you so much for attending today. We look forward to hopefully seeing many more of you in person here on campus in the fall. And uh, if you need to reach us, feel free to contact us at the number listed on the screen, as well as INTL advising at ucf.edu. I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thank you so much for joining and go Knights, charge on. Thanks everybody.